Thinking about your New Year's resolutions? Ready for a new level of personal empowerment? Pause, think about it with intentional thought and consider where we go from here. Stay tuned and hear Dr. Chris Curry's what he got to say about how the voices of the people can empower the majority rule 2.0 transformation. And join our co-sponsors, Dom Dev Enterprises and Page Investment, and our friends at Islandese Realty D1 Development, Sammy's Chicken, and Kara and the boys down there at Raspy uh, Barbershop. Share your questions, post online, tell us where you are at, and how you enjoyed the holiday yesterday. And we'll be right back after this message. Something to think about with Dale Happy Knowles. Welcome to something to think about with Dale Happy Knowles. What we think, we become. What we radiate, we attract. And what we imagine, we surely can achieve. Let's change the narrative 242. So this evening we have no stranger with us today. Um, we have a gentleman who is a professor, an author, historian, and now an executive director of the Antiquities and Monuments Museums Corporation of the Bahamas. Big shots gone to bed. <laughs> he is no stranger, as I said, and he's been on our panels for leadership, where we talk about what was strong leadership requirements in the Bahamas, and also one on politics, and what was required of the pol political arena coming in on the brink of our national election at that point in time. And so, we promised him that we were going to bring him back to be solo and not share the stage with other people. And so today, uh, Doc, I am living up to my promise. Um, it's a little hard to get you back, but I mean, I still wasn't going to give up. Welcome. Well, it certainly is uh, uh, an honor to be on your show, first of all. And let me say, I'm so happy that you honored your commitment. You kept your promise. Um, I'm excited about the conversation tonight, and I'm glad to be flying solo. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, well, so as I mentioned just now, yesterday we celebrated majority rule. And majority rule principally, in my mindset, is the enabling of equal political access for all of our citizens, irrespective of their gender, their race, their creed, their business uh, um, situation, or their, whether they own property. And I mentioned them all because they have significant reasons why I mentioned them. Mm -hmm. There was one man, one vote that came about that allowed for this majority rule to be called majority rule. And in the Bahamas, we call it majority rule, but it's technically majority governance, uh, governance by the people. And so, as I say normally, that it enables the voice of the majority of, peop of the people to rule, not necessarily the people who are in the majority to rule. That became a secondary item of this action, and thanks be to glory that it did, because the majority in the Bahamas were being oppressed, mm -hmm. um, whether they were the blacks, whether they were mulattoes, the sambos, or whatever other, maroons, etc including what I consider to be the non-lily whites. They are the whites who were not in the clique mm -hmm. of a small crew of people who managed and ruled in the Bahamas mm -hmm. as in the government. And so that's what it means to me, Doc. What does it mean to you? Yeah, I, I think it, you've hit the uh, point on, right? That you're talking about uh, a, a real democratic process at work. And, and you know, we like to celebrate the date, the event, January 10th. Mm -hmm. But truth be told, you know, you cannot celebrate the moment without understanding that the process behind that. It wasn't something that happened overnight. Some of the series of electoral reform or changes that occurred that culminated with 67 need to be underscored and highlighted for, for Bahamians to appreciate what majority rule actually represents. Because 
you know, you, you mentioned, for example, uh, you said one man, one vote. Right. Um, some people might say one person, one vote. But the point stands that, you know, there was a time when an individual uh, could vote multiple times in multiple constituencies mm -hmm. on multiple days. I mean, that's three times over where you have a problem. Uh, you could imagine in the 1950s, if we were to draw back uh, over a decade earlier, you had a situation where because of the company vote, you had an individual who might have had, let's just say, for example, you had a law office, mm -hmm. and we're assuming you're a Bay Street boy, and that means a lot. It's a loaded term, but unpacking mm -hmm. it really means you're part of a small clique or an oligarchy that controls the social, economic, and political spheres of behavior in society up until majority rule. Uh, you're formalizing as a party in 1958 called the UBP, but you're really operating way before that. Mm -hmm. But you could vote if you had a law office downtown. That's one vote because you're going to be in, in, in the, the district uh, of the downtown Nassau area. Right. Uh, let's say you have a house on Eastern Road. Um, you know, they mm -hmm. call that area the White Knights area. And, 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 you know, in some ways that hasn't changed much demographically. Mm -hmm. But you could vote a second time where your, your house was located. Mm -hmm. Let's imagine that you also had a cottage, as many of them did in Harbor Island, right? Mm -hmm. So your property in Harbor Island allows you to vote a third time. And then you might have had some, some land on uh, North Eleuthera, the mainland, you know, across from, from Harbor Island. Right. And, and that would allow you to vote again. So wherever the, there was property and, and you, you had that, you could vote multiple times. And they made it easy for themselves. Remember, they're passing laws that benefit their own, their right. own group. Mm -hmm. So they made it easy because the elections weren't held on a single day. So that gave you time to travel to these different places to vote. And then, you know, the, the other issue was there was no secret ballot. So right. as early as the 1920s, uh, I believe it was around 1929, Sir Milo Butler uh, was, was very upset with the fact that he was contesting the Western District against Sir Harry Oakes. Mm -hmm. And he, he publicly stated, there's no way I can win against this man because I don't have the kind of money and, aff and influence that he has. And right. with no secret ballot, I'm doomed to fail. I mean, this is what Sir Milo was saying. So mm -hmm. he launched a campaign along with others. They were actually called the Ballot Box Party. Before we had formalized politics, you had people who were campaigning for a secret ballot. Mm -hmm. It took them so long to get that secret ballot established. I mean, they, they put it in, in practice um, to a degree in New Providence, I think, by, by 1949. They tested it, in other words. But it was mm -hmm. never universally applied until 1959. Right. Could you imagine? You're talking about 20, 30 years of, of you know, doing these tests, having uh, some secret ballots applied in some areas and then in others not. Right. Uh, but in 1959, the secret ballot is fab finally universally applied across the bonds. And so that that allows for the majority to speak a little bit more. But even then, in 59, it wasn't a majority. 59 right. is also the year, Dale, when you have male universal suffrage. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, you may think, oh, that's strange. What do you mean by male? I mean, you should think about, you know, women's suffrage movement. But we forget that male suffrage was enacted only as late as 59. Before 59, mm -hmm. the qualification for a male to vote was property, mm -hmm. not your age. So in 1959, for the first time, the qualifications for a male to vote has changed from property to your age. And it was 21, not 18, 21 mm -hmm. for males. So that opens the gates for the majority to have a chance in the democratic process. But again, it is muted by the fact that women still aren't voting. Right. Right. So half your population can't vote, even though you have universal suffrage for men. And by the way, that was a recommendation that Lennox Boy, the colonial secretary, made after the general strike one year earlier. Okay. He actually came to the Bahamas about three months after the general strike and said, look, y'all need to, besides all the labor laws that y'all need to enact and, you know, establishing minimum wage and a department of labor, y'all need to uh, move forward with uh, electoral reform. And that was mm -hmm. one of the things that he recommended. So, you know, the, the argument could be made that that itself would not have happened had it not been pressure 
put on from the colonial okay. office and pressure being put on by the black masses demonstrating mm -hmm. in the general strike. So moving forward, 1961 is when women finally um, are given the legal right to vote in the Bahamas based on universal suffrage again. But mm -hmm. they don't exercise that until 1962, November 26, right. 1962. So again, the door is open for the de democratic process to function in a much more inclusive way. So here again, we have... Uh, majority rule operating in a sense, right? And in 62, mm -hmm. uh, people thought that the PLP would win because they they had, of course, applied universal suffrage for both men and women. And it seemed like since the PLP were supportive of that move in general, that they had a better chance. Well, they won the popular vote, but they lost the, the, the general election. And the reason is, is because of the way in which the constituency boundaries were established that favored the UVP. And mm -hmm. remember, you had, I believe, only seven constituencies in New Providence in 1962, even though close to 70% of the population lived in New Providence. So you had to deal now with the gerrymandering issue, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, the manipulation of the boundaries to favor your, your candidates as the government. You had two and three seat constituencies in at least two major islands where you had larger white populations. Mm -hmm. And I'm speaking here about Eleuthera, Abaco, and Long Island. Right. North Eleuthera had three seat constituency, right? Long Island had um, a small population, but they had two seat constituencies. Abaco the same way. So you had the majority of constituencies in the family islands, although right. the majority of the population was in New Providence. Yeah, the importance of that, Doc, was that, that because of the plural vote, then they yeah. were able to double up on votes in those places and, and win more of the seats to keep yes. the majority of people were in Nassau and Grand Bahama. Exactly. And, and that is how, through that unfair system, and it really was unfair, mm -hmm. that you could, and, and again, the other thing, you still didn't have one person, one vote, you know? Mm -hmm. So you could still have people, even though the company vote was, was done away with, and it was based now on, on age, universal suffrage, you could still vote more than once because because you had these double and triple seat constituencies. Yeah. Yeah. But so the know, whole system was still unfair. Yeah. Still unfair. And and and, and then don't forget, we didn't have things like the indelible ink and all yeah. that. And the secret ballot had only just been established in 59. So there was a lot of unfair tactics being applied to the elections. Yeah. And the significance of 67 then, I mean, just looking at this as a technocrat, mm -hmm. the significance is you have the best organized and best structured election, right? Because, you know, theoretically, one person, one vote. You right. still, people will tell you they still didn't do away with the double seats, the triple seats. That comes a little later, right? right? But at least you could prevent people from voting more than once. Yeah. Right? And, and so that's really key in 67. So I, I had to do the long road, the journey yeah, yeah. to demonstrate to people that the key value in celebrating majority rule, it, it, it is that, yes, the PLP won, and we shouldn't take that away, but they would not have won if those changes hadn't taken place. And right. to have a fair, democratically run election, I think is significant, where the majority were able to speak finally with their feet. And when I say they speak, spoke with their feet, I mean they went and they lined up to vote and they made their vote count. So yeah, that, there you go. Yeah, but in all fairness now, the, the, the PLP um, will claim that they won that election. They, they became the government of the day, um, but it was 1818. And right. they had the yeah. two yeah. who their support. Right. right. So, so there was some, that, that's another, again, another myth that has to be, you know, mm -hmm. destroyed, I suppose. Yeah, the, the PLP were in a tie, 1818, with UVP. And, you know, the election occurs on January 10th. I believe it was a Friday. But, I mean, over the weekend, there had to be some serious negotiations, right? right. I mean, mm -hmm. because you had a tie. And so it was going to be a government by coalition. Right. And uh, Pindley was able to um, negotiate with Alvin Brennan. Uh, and, and, of course, the Labour Party representative... Uh, in, in, in Randall Fox. And, and, you know, again, this, this is a, we got to make sure people understand this. 
Randall Fox was formerly a member of the PLP. Right. Mm -hmm. Left the people, PLP, and he formed the Labour Party. And he was a significant figure in the Labour Party, in the Labour movement. Of course, we know about 1958 general strike, mm -hmm. um, uh, the sedition trial you should also know about. Yeah. Uh, you should also know that you would not have had a, a Labor Day um, holiday, uh, a Labor Day parade, had it not been for Sir Randall Fox. He mm -hmm. was a formidable force in Bahamian politics. And, and mind you, uh, there was a time when people thought he, rather than Pimling, should have been the face of the PLP. Well, that didn't happen. And right. Pimling was more of a pragmatic politician. And Randall Fox was more of the... Uh, um, the, the fire uh, brand kind of preacher, radical mm -hmm. um, Labour Party leader. Yeah, and people are scared of him. Conservative mm -hmm. members of the PLP, going back to H.M. Taylor and Cyril Stevenson, then, um, I think that Pindling was more palatable. Uh, mm -hmm. He was, was more digestible as a, right. as a leader, right. Right. as a middle of the road pragmatist. I say all of that to point out, though, that by 67, that there was a conscious decision that Randall Fox had to make, who had fallen out with PLP, mm -hmm. formed the Labour Party, had gone on his own, mm -hmm. and was a formidable force. But understanding the, the moment, the magnitude of the moment, he is going to join in a coalition where he becomes the Minister of Labour. Right. And then on the other side, to paint a portrait about Alvin Brennan, Alvin Brennan was an Lutheran. He was in the UBP at one point. Mm -hmm. become disenchanted with them and ran as an independent candidate. So I want people to know this mm -hmm. man was not a UBP when he ran in 67. He was an independent. Right. Right? Now, he had mm -hmm. UBP background. He had ran on the UBP ticket previously. Mm -hmm. but he ran as an independent. And that's significant. Um, because of his decision to take on the position of Speaker of the House, right. align with the PLP to form the government. That is significant. And those two men made history, along with the PLP, because the PLP forms the yeah. coalition government. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lyndon Pindling does become the second Premier of the yeah. Bahamas. Right. Uh, and, and so we have to see that as significant. And then again, of significance, is that you also have a Bahamian cabinet that is comprised of people who look like the majority of the people in the mm -hmm. Bahamas. Right, yeah, right. And, you know, and not to take away from anybody else on the PLP side, because they, they've, they've spoken about that in, in great length over the years, um, to the point where we are almost playing ping pong, because uh, <laughs> this is our community, our country, doesn't seem to be able to get to the point where we will recognize these events as national events more so than political events. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that is something that we so young, we, we're not even 55 yet. So, you know, kind of thing. We're going to, I hope we will grow into that at some point in time that both sides, because one tried to take away that it didn't exist and the other one overemphasized that, oh, we won't let you forget that it happened. And so, a lot of the youth are confused and yeah. then they just tune out because they say man you're just bigging up your chest and things like that so you know they they're not interested because then my son and his friends and stuff they when i talk to them about it you know a lot of them say man that's just old people talking you know kind of thing <laughs> yeah well you know the one thing that we can do is is say that it didn't happen um, right Right. As, a, as an anthropologist, a Haitian anthropologist who I love, he wrote the book, uh, The Silencing the Past, The Power and Production of History. And he says, you know, uh, the past is what, ha what, is, what has happened. Mm -hmm. History is what is said to have happened. Right, right. Yeah. And so you may say, well, that's, a, that's yeah. a play on words. But yeah. there's a really important distinction. The past, you can't change. It's there. Mm -hmm. It happened. All right. Yeah. Just like, you know, 1492, Columbus arrived. We may not like the man. We may have issues with what he did, but you can't change October 12, 1492. It happened. Mm -hmm. But you know what you can change is how you view the past. That's history, right. you know, the interpretation, right. the meaning behind it. Right. So where we're at as a country, as we're coming up to our 50th anniversary, is you know we know it happened, but we don't quite know how or why it happened to an extent, and mm -hmm. we don't understand mm -hmm. the significance of it. That mm -hmm. to me. 
that last question is the big one is what is the significance what is the legacy what is the enduring legacy of majority rule that, that's the one we are really struggling with yeah well i have that as a question on the duck but but loren mcdonald has says um what what is the mandate of the national reparations committee led by yourself um well, well yeah. no i am not leading it i am a supporter i'm a champion of it i'm a member of the committee but i resigned as the chair of the national reparations committee in 2018 uh july 30th i believe is my last day okay. and i submitted my resignation to the ministry of foreign affairs and in that resignation i recommended dr naimi hall campbell dean as the chair of the reparations committee i stand by that she's a colleague of mine she's a wonderful lady and i thought it was important to to recommend a female to lead the reparations movement if you know anything about the caribbean representation on reparations uh, it's a caricom initiative mm -hmm. and all all of the heads of the different caricom uh, reparations commissions are men and uh, except for one or two, one of the significant female leaders is Dr. Maureen Shepherd, Jamaica's National Reparations Commission leader. But I felt that the Bahamas should, you know, be progressive enough to have a female uh, as its chair. And Naomi is a fantastic person. I'm looking forward to being publicly recognized as the chair of our Reparations Commission. Good. Okay, and also a shout out to Vanessa Colby, Colby who, who uh, joined us earlier. Um, thanks for joining us and being with us. So, Doc, um, we're not, uh, majority rule in my mindset would not be real if there weren't people. And mm -hmm. one of the persons that stands out to me at the apex, and that's um, some of my friends who are going to fall out their chair when I say that, that's it. That's a, above Sir Lyndon Pinnon and Dr. Miles Monroe. Mm -hmm. in this in this light and that is sir sydney you know and um and i say that because sir Lyndon's tenure as powerful and as great as it was a lot of his influence and the like was limited to people of um our diaspora and the caribbean the bahamas and the caribbean and some of the other places for say now, granted he was global yes and miles monroe dr miles monroe even though he was global, um, it also was limited somewhat to the religious set more so than, than anybody else. And so, but, um, so Sydney, he's like Michael Jackson. I mean, it, it, he's just all over influencing everybody. And, you, and it's sad to me that we don't, we don't talk about him in here as much as uh, most people think he just abandoned us, but, uh, but anyway, what's your thoughts on that before we... So let me say a couple of things first as I open up on this conversation about Sydney, Sir Sydney and his role in um, the whole majority rule discussion. First of all, Sir Sydney is to acting what Muhammad Ali is to sports. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying in that is that he is one of those global figures, an iconic mm -hmm. figure who is well recognized around the world. I would say he is probably the most recognizable Hollywood actor of color. Um, mm -hmm. And he just, he has surpassed uh, all of these other persons that you might put up there. And of course, he's the Jackie Robinson of, <laughs> of acting too, right. opening right. the gate for African-American actors mm -hmm. to come in. And there was no path before him. He, if you've listened to some of the speeches that people have been replaying, uh, whether it was at Oscars or at a Lifetime, uh, award ceremony, he spoke to the fact that he was the trailblazer. There was mm -hmm. no path for him to take. He had to create his own path. So mm -hmm. that, I just wanted to put that out there. The second thing I want to highlight, um, and this story may have been told, but I'll tell it again. Um, when you think about majority rule, uh, in 1950, there was a, a film, one of Sir Sidney's first films, uh, No Way Out. Mm -hmm. And in that movie, he starred as, as a medical doctor with a uh, uh, a staff, a medical staff below him, I, I must echo below, subalterns or um, mm -hmm. persons who were his inferior, who were um, um, were um, answerable to him as the boss. He was the boss uh, of the department. Right. And you could just imagine the consternation that the Bay Street Boys had <laughs> if a film, not just showcasing an educated black doctor, but one mm -hmm. 
was the boss. You're right. You're right. Of white subalterns, that they, they would have just uh, had real problems with that. So they banned mm -hmm. the film in 1950. Well, guess what? The, the Citizens Committee emerged out of that. This was a protest group uh, led right. by uh, Dr. Burnside. Um, this would have been Jackson and Stanley Burnside's father. Right. Mm -hmm. It would have been led by people like Thaddeus too, and other like progressive reformers. And this is before the PLP was formed. Right. They protest the Savoy and the Bay Street Boys banning the movie. Eventually, the ban is is uh, removed, and that's seen as a as a win. In, in 1950s Bahamas, mm -hmm. protest the film and to have the ban removed as a win, and that's a, an example of proto politics in the age of majority rule. Right. Now, Sydney, besides the film itself, doing a whole lot of good for the morale of black right. people right mm -hmm. just the psychology of watching a film like that and feeling like wow this dude is like you know starring and, and he's the the smartest guy in the room and he's the guy in charge i mean that had to emancipate people from that mental slavery just to see right. that right. The psychology that was powerful but beyond that when we get to the 1960s i understand and i'll tell you there's a secret i'm going to release here my co-author of a book that's soon to be published on um, the modern political history of the Bahamas, 1920 mm -hmm. to 2020, Dr. Keith Tinker wrote a chapter that I'm about mm -hmm. to review. He sent it to me yesterday, actually. Uh, and he actually looked at the influence of Hollywood and religious figures in the Bahamas on majority rule. So he actually mm -hmm. told the story about how Sidney uh, came back to the Bahamas and he brought with him, I want to say he brought Harry Belafonte with him. Yeah, he did at one point. And a couple other um, black actors. And he drove around the city and encouraged people to go out and get registered to vote. Mm -hmm. He literally went around and got people to register to vote. I mean, mm -hmm. And he put money behind his cause where mm -hmm. it was necessary. There's a story, and I actually posted this to Facebook uh, two days ago. I got it from a friend, ironically, in Canada. Sydney also did the same kind of thing in, in the Deep South, in the U.S. Uh, in Mississippi in 1964, 65, uh, the SNCC, that's the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, was running a voter registration campaign. And they, they were lacking serious funding. So mm -hmm. Harry Belafonte and Sir Sidney raised $70,000, got mm -hmm. on a plane, went to the deep south, got off the plane. And, I mean, you know, I guess when uh, <laughs> the, the white supremacists of that area got word or wind that these two men, these black men, were coming to, to, to help the voter campaign out, mm -hmm. they, they were obviously out to get them. And right. apparently the whole ride from the airport so wherever it was that they were supposed to meet up and, and exchange the funds, there was a vehicle that was driving behind them at a very close proximity. Right. Literally, like they had to um, be on guard the entire ride to ensure that they didn't stop wow. uh, or anything, or else they could have been lynched. Literally, right. they were. And, and we guess Sydney said to, to Harry, he said, "You know, uh, we guess we're gonna we're gonna either live or die <laughs> together because this is it." Yeah, yeah. And, and that kind of um, that kind of activism, a mm -hmm. lot of times gets overshadowed by the brilliance of Sir Sidney's movie career, 71 years in theater and movies. Wow, wow. But he was an yeah, activist yeah. and mm -hmm. he was passionate about voter registration and he was passionate about black people voting for their rights to elect who they wanted as their public official. And he did it in the Bahamas and he did it in the United States as well. Awesome, awesome. And so I mean that majority rule and people like Sir Sidney and others, um, and, and we could mention some of them as we go, but would have been very significant. I mean, and I'm only mentioning the people who we don't normally mention because they are the normal successors and so, um, <coughs> the Lindens and the rest who, no matter who we hear over and over and over and over and over again. And so part of the, the impetus for the show is to get educated or get information out that is not normally discussed. And so that's why I'm glad that I always could draw on your brain box to pull up on some of this history that, that exists because it's sure ain't in my head. Um, <laughs> the only thing on my head is the light that's shining from the top. Well, I have, um, the, same, I have the same head, it seems, eh? <laughs> yeah. 
So before we go any further, though, let's 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 just pause because um, we were supposed to do this at about five or ten minutes into the show, but um, pause to give him reverence and and to do so, we will do it in a different way, and and that we will play a a film, short film, um, produced which our producer will will say who it is at the end of the film. Um, Madam Producer. To our sir, with love. Is it sir, or will just Sydney do? For a brown-skinned boy who had never seen his own face except in Cat Island's clear waters and in the love reflected in his parents' eyes. Did you see yourself? Though destined for a shoebox burial as a babe, though born of tomato farmers, though just a boy alone in the Big Apple, largely illiterate, far into a future of character on and off stage where no one dared call you anything less than mister. Have the sirs, Lyndon, Randall, and Cecil, my father Harold, in AD2, you know, the government high crew, showing you where they knock domino, chewing on toothpicks, reminiscent of Yinna Yutin, talking about the old days when native black boys dove into treacherous Nassau harbors for prize coins to offer white gays its requisite entertainment. Do you talk instead about majestic women of different hues or do you brag about overcoming demand and taking y'all's place as the fledgling of black Bahamians in the race for a big, beautiful, black future? Do you mind not being on a dollar bill on a building or in an anthem? Or is it okay that you have given us the sun and hung the moon? I wonder. I wonder, did we give you all your flowers? Or are we the lilies of your field? To Our Sir with Love was written and narrated by Dr. Crystal A. De Gregory. A proud native of Freeport, Bahamas, Dr. Crystal A. De Gregory is a graduate of the historic Fisk University. In addition to holding a Master of Education degree from Tennessee State University, she was one of the first ever Black PhDs in the Department of History at Vanderbilt University. Currently, she is a researcher fellow at Middle Tennessee State University and serves as the founder of the Digital Storytelling Projects, HBCU Story and Dorian and Beyond, which preserves the story of Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas. So, Doc, I, I wanted that to be played for two reasons. One, to give people a touch of, of what people think of Sir Sidney and, and the like, but also um, to highlight the 
author, um, the, the writer and narrator mm -hmm. in there, uh, Dr. Crystal A. De Gregory. Uh, I don't know if you know her. Um, I don't know her, but Madam Producer does. And we went to great trends to get their approval to play it on the air today and so forth. But I wanted to just highlight that because majority rule really and truly was that step that allowed for all of the other steps to happen for a document like this to be produced from, I guess, for us to even be on this mm -hmm. platform that we are on now, because we might still have been somewhere else. Um, maybe not <laughs> you, you could have passed, um, but I don't know about me. But <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, let me first say, I do know Dr. Crystal de Gregory. Mm -hmm. uh, I know her family from Grand Bahama. Um, my wife actually knows her. She's met her in person in Jamaica at one time. Um, and, and so I'm very familiar with her work. Uh, I'm, I'm very um, familiar with her work uh, on uh, the, the historically black colleges and universities. I mm -hmm. mentioned that she went to, to Fisk and she got her PhD from Vanderbilt. So I, I'm familiar with her work. She's one of those uh, extremely valuable Bahamians who for good or for bad are working abroad. Um, I put her up there in the same category as a Rosanna Adderley, for example. Wow. Dr. Rosanna Adderley is a historian. She works out of Tulane University, and she's mm -hmm. also the daughter of Paul Adderley mm -hmm. uh, from that line of very important persons. And Paul Adderley, by the way, would have been an important person to consider in this whole discussion of majority rule. Mm -hmm. uh, he was in the PLP, and then in 1965, um, with the Black Tuesday incident, him and Orville Turgut, Quest and Spurgeon Bethel um, broke away and formed the NDP. Mm -hmm. uh, but Paul Adderley eventually returned to the PLP just in time for independence in the 72 election. Mm -hmm. uh, was significant as an architect of, of Bahamian independence, in my opinion. Um, so, so, you know, he's another person that I would put up there. Um, mm -hmm. We have a company named after um, Paul Adderley now, if you drive out west. Uh, but the question arises from the video, if I could just say, you know, should we have more than a bridge right. recognizing Sir Sidney as, as, a, um, as an important Bahamian? Mm -hmm. Should he be um, venerated as a national hero? Right. Should he be considered up there with, with Bin Ling and, and um, uh, Milo Butler? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and um, I heard the other day that that there is a either a school of film or um, something that is put up in a university or someplace in his name, or he built it or, or the like. Um, I'm just thinking that what mileage we could get in terms of building our sense of identity if yeah. something like that would have been done here. Not saying yeah. not to do it there too, but I mean, yeah. you know. There's a film school or theater school, school that's, right. that's, mm -hmm. that he started that's still there, bears his name. I'm not sure where it's located and if it's in California or somewhere else, but mm -hmm. I think that's what you're alluding to. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of traction, I think, in this moment to consider uh, if we want to do the same. Uh, like, for example, we have a Clement E. Bethel National right. Arts Festival, right, mm -hmm. named after the first director of culture in the Bahamas. Uh, we have an airport obviously named after uh, Lyndon Pinling. We have other buildings, lots of buildings bear different persons' names. Mm -hmm. uh, what should we do with Sir Sidney besides right. a bridge? That's a great question. I'm wondering, too, how we are to celebrate his life and legacy. And the funeral, I'm imagining, is, imagining is going to probably be a private one in the U.S. But right. have our political leaders thought about what they might want to do over here as a celebration, as a ceremony, whatever? Right. And so folks out there, um, wherever you are, whether it's Dubai and um, Japan or wherever, um, tell us, shoot us a note, tell us what you think should be done or the like, um, what should be, even with majority rule, because that also is another um, milestone that is really unsung in a lot of ways, right? We tend to polarize it politically, but, um, and so forth. But 55 years, uh, um, Doc, um, what have we learned from majority rule? Uh, th that's a good question. Um, one of the things I've been saying lately is let's not think of 67 as an end point. Mm 
-hmm. That's not the end of the journey. Um, that, that might be just a chapter in an ongoing uh, story that is still unfolding. Mm -hmm. So what, one, of the, one of the problems is if we rest on the laurels of 67, then we are not doing what the people who made 67 happen would want right. for this generation, right. which is to say we should be pressing the issues that are, are in our forefront that are issues that affect democracy. And what do I mean by that? We still have an issue, in my opinion, with gender, right? We have underrepresentation of women in parliament. Yes, we now have seven, but you can call them the magnificent seven or whatever you want. But, you know, we have a parliament that has 39 members, but only seven are female. That's a problem. Uh, we know that in our constitution, there are discriminatory elements, uh, one way or other, that speaks mm -hmm. to gender issues, all right? We understand that in our workplace, in our country, that women are underpaid, right? In the various areas, technical or not, uh, compared to men. Uh, and so, um, though you might say you have more women, you know, doctors, lawyers, accountants, whatever, uh, that may be true, but, you know, you have to look at that pay scale. Right. And uh, I've seen studies that suggest that women are being underpaid compared to men in our country. So there are a whole lot of gender related issues. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, uh, let's not even, well, not say let's not, let us look at the issue of gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. Because we have a serious problem with gender-based violence. Women are vulnerable in their mm -hmm. homes. We still have men who hold on to antiquated ideas about, you know, the woman is their property and, right, right. and they can do what they want in marriage. You can beat them to a pulp because that's mm -hmm. their woman. Mm -hmm. Like they own the woman. And so, you know, we have some real antiquated ideas in that area that need to be addressed. So what we are talking about then is seeing majority rule and the principles of democracy extended to a new generation of Bahamians, Bahamian mm -hmm. activists and thinkers who are going to press the button of democracy and democratic principles in this time, in this age. Awesome. Yeah. So, on. Um I believe the youth of our nation are the ones who are going to really start that movement in terms of critical mass. Uh, not necessarily that they will be the one who push the turn the key, but when it gets rolling a little bit, it's going to be them who are going to push everybody over the over the cliff. Yeah, and, and then you know other issues like um, we we still have issues with with our whole electoral system. Like we, we mm -hmm. were talking earlier about the fifties and the sixties, but we still don't have an independent boundaries commission. Right, right. We don't have. I, I know I was involved with the debates, um, and I, I I was happy to be involved. It was a lot of work, but I lament the fact that we don't have a national debate commission. Um, I, I attended a, a workshop few months ago, um, at the beginning of, it wasn't a few, it was actually the beginning of December, uh, we had people from Jamaica's Debate Commission, Guyana's mm -hmm. Debate Commission, Peru's Debate Commission, all of these different Latin American and Caribbean um, territories came together and, 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 and we had a discussion about how do we advance democracy through uh, mm -hmm. formalized debate uh, competitions. And, you know, it was fantastic to hear colleagues from all kinds of different places saying the same thing, how sometimes these ideas are eroded by the very uh, government themselves, reluctance to engage in a debate, uh, excuses over format, mm -hmm. uh, various issues. You know, so again, uh, a healthy democracy, you have to have debates. Right. You have to have an independent boundaries commission. Um, you, you have to have uh, the, in law, you know, uh, elements of, of um, you know, two-term rule. Um, uh, in other words, regulations regarding limits to, to, to how long a person could be in office. Mm -hmm. All of these things have, have been talked about, um, but we don't see the enactment of laws related to these very important electoral changes. And then, of course, the big fish, uh, republicanism. We saw what happened in Barbados recently. Mm -hmm. Uh, are we to go down that same road? Um, so these, these are all uh, very germane questions mm -hmm. that our current generation needs to be asking, much like the generation in the 1960s when majority rule uh, came about. Yeah. Well, you know, I put one on the table because I always say to me the number one priority um, 
separate and apart from COVID, um, of, a, of a new administration to me should be po uh, political reform. Yeah. Uh, I get a lot of slack from my friends for saying that. They say, oh, we have this issue and we have crime and we have that. To me, it all starts with the reform we have because I mean, let's just look at our cabinet. I mean, how would we select our cabinet? Or how we select um, attorney general, not attorney general, the um, the um, chief justices and the rest of those. So, uh, it, yeah. it, it doesn't lend for the the way our constitution is structured to actually function um, because they, for whatever reason, people seem to have trained that they have ties back to the position of the prime minister, which that's really a subordinate business position in a way. But um, before you answer, um, shout out to you, Des, Des, Des uh, Taylor. She was uh, on our show before and good for tuning in. Go ahead, Doc. No, I was, I was just going to say, yeah, all, all of those are really important questions. Uh, I think they should be the first. They should be on, uh, not, not the back burner, but they should be on the front mm -hmm. of uh, discussions in, in the government. Uh, I don't want to say they're low-hanging fruit because a lot of these things do take no, time right. and mm -hmm. effort to, to think about. But another one of those that I thought about was uh, a, a set election date. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, that can't be too difficult. Uh, I don't think you need to have a referendum for that. But but why can't we have a set election date? Um, right. You know, I mean, uh, the consternation that I experienced trying to organize the debates last year and then not knowing when the election was going to happen, the planned debates near the election but not too far away, and all of that, uh, that all was anxiety that didn't need to be created because mm -hmm. we didn't know when the election, and then there right. was a stop election, mm -hmm. and the rest is history. But again, mm -hmm. these are things that, you know, democracies have in place, right? you know? Um, it, go ahead. No, I was going to say, um, but when we do these changes, sometimes we just do changes because people think that we need to change. We need to understand what it is that we are changing from so we know that we're not changing to something worse. And so when we go to a fixed election date, um, my thing would be on that is that, okay, we could put in place the fixed election date, but make sure that you put in place something with a lot of teeth that you could remove somebody before mm -hmm. that date, if needs be, and not just have it like how it is now, where um, granted the people stood up when, in my view, that's what caused the, the, the snap election, is the people, it ain't got nothing to do with nothing else with nobody else say. The people pressure over the last four, three, three years you know, was what just got to everybody, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You, you don't want a knee-jerk reaction and just say, mm -hmm. oh, I, I want to make changes just to change. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a way, we see that at a micro level every time an election happens and you have boards dismantled and then new boards established. And, mm -hmm. You know, all the good ideas that the last four had get thrown out just because that was the, the last party that lost the election. Mm -hmm. Well, no, we have to do better than that. We have to recognize that some, that some good came out of those boards that were in operation before the previous election. Right. And, and and good ideas sh should be good ideas regardless right. of who germinates the idea. I don't politicize every concept, every right. proposal that comes before your table. Mm -hmm. If it's a good idea, run with it. Yeah. And yeah. Um, you know that that's my view. I I, I I happen to sit in a meeting on Friday with a fantastic idea. I'm not going to go into the details, but um, I, you know I was with the minister and and he said you know this is a great idea. And I loved hearing that because mm -hmm. that's what should be the primary function of government is to determine what's the best way forward right. and, and to pursue the common good. Mm -hmm. The common good means that you're not looking out for the self-interest of, of you and your friends. Mm -hmm. You're not looking out for, you know, your party because right. that's your party. You're looking for the best idea that would advance our country in the most efficient and effective way. Right. You see, that, that again is, is another idea that's enshrined in 67, the dream of 67 majority rule, mm -hmm. is for us to operate for the common good of all behaviors, regardless of color, mm -hmm. regardless of status, regardless of class, you look for the betterment of the Bahamian people. Right. right? And again, you know, taking on the words of Martin Luther King, you know, we, we would like to think, although I don't think we're quite there yet, Dale, mm -hmm. That a person is judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. Right, right. But unfortunately, we know that people get jobs because of connections. People are promoted because of connections. We are not yet where we need to be as a country. We're getting there. We're getting there. 
um, but we still have some way to go. Yeah. And so that, as we said, that we, we need to define democracy. Now, I don't know if anybody in the world could really define that clearly, but I mean, I guess everybody have their, their view of what democracy is. But she also says here that that comes with maturity and the betterment of all people. Right, very much so. Well, you, you know, um, Aristotle and the Greeks, they actually didn't like democracy because um, they saw democracy as rather um, scary. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the rule of the majority they thought would lead to anarchy and chaos, right? Mm -hmm. And they couldn't mm -hmm. conceive of a democracy actually operating in a way that would uh, allow for peace, order, and good governance. Right. But mm -hmm. it was tested in the medieval period of the small city-states like Venice and Florence, where they saw that democracy actually could work uh, at, 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 on a small scale. Right. The real mm -hmm. litmus test came with the United States uh, and its constitution in 1788. Uh, the federal constitution uh, was the first test case where you have a democracy under Republican model for mm -hmm. a much larger territory, right? And you right. know, the United States expanded even more after 1788. The point I'm trying to make in all this is, is the idea of democracy is actually in its testing grounds is a relatively new phenomenon. As a political mm -hmm. system, it's only been around really for 200 years. Right. You know, right. for the most, for most of world history, people have been governed by monarchies, and dictators, mm -hmm. <laughs> oligarchs, mm -hmm. emperors, uh, but very few countries until the modern era had, uh, you know, a democratic system in place. So, you know, we have to have a bird's eye view sometimes when we think about what's happening in the Bahamas and understand mm -hmm. that even us, we're caught up in the wave of a relatively new system of government. When I say new, I mean, I'm talking over the span of world history. Uh, right. It's still relatively new, right? And so now um, let's let's shift slightly from people to the other voices, the voices that people normally don't don't pay attention to, the voices of statues, the voices of of different elements of society that we have in our culture and and around, and which now I believe, um, based on your title. A lot of those things fall under your hat, which is see how the good Lord works. He just line up these things, which was in play for a long time, and now you got something yeah. that you wanted to talk about. How do those things, um, those voices, um, how do we leverage those voices, or how do those voices become uh, catalysts for a majority rule 2.0? Well, I, I'm the director of the Antiquities, Monuments, and Museum Corporation of the Bahamas. And that means that our job is to preserve the patrimony of the Bahamian people. Mm -hmm. That means to break it down, we're interested in preserving our history, our heritage, uh, defending our, our, our forts, our museums, our ruins, mm -hmm. uh, and, and being sort of the governing authority for determining whether people should come in and, and, and dive or dig for mm -hmm. our treasures, uh, right. talking about archaeological works in that mm -hmm. place. So, so uh, you know, for me, I have a very strong commitment to making sure that our patrimony is protected. Mm -hmm. I also have a very strong commitment to, to seeing us uh, do much better with the heritage assets that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, the orange economy, you may have heard this present government talking a lot about that when they were campaigning. It's a billion-dollar right. industry that's expanding. Mm -hmm. And uh, billions of dollars are being made in heritage tourism and other areas related. And so we need to find a way to tap into that in a very creative way. We've learned from Sir Sydney and others just how amazingly creative our people are. Mm -hmm. But it's still really an untapped potential. And so mm -hmm. we need to move from ideas to action. That's our one of the, the, the weaknesses that I see is we have great ideas, but a lot of times they get stalled at the committee stage and we don't see them evolving into real action. We need to get there. I believe we need to have sooner than later a, a real beautiful uh, National Heroes Park. I know under the last mm. uh, PLP administration, there was a real move on the foot. They actually had a, a ceremony uh, to establish in the Botanical Gardens area, National Heroes okay. Park. Mm -hmm. But all that is left there is the sign. And I'll tell you, the sign is broken. I've seen the sign. Mm -hmm. There's no park to speak of. There's no monuments to speak of. Mm -hmm. So we need to work assiduously towards having a National Heroes Park. And then we could talk about who we would want to enshrine mm -hmm. in that park. And as someone who is at the forefront of heritage in the Bahamas, 
I'm looking forward to that day and I'm, I'm working towards uh, some other events that would allow us to celebrate who we are and also to remind us of our collective memory. You know, uh, people's identity is tied very much to their understanding of their past. Right. And Marcus Garvey said that. He said, a man without knowledge of his past is like a tree without roots. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with rootlessness in the Bahamas because we have such a vague and underappreciated appre appreciation of our history. Mm -hmm. and, and so my job is to bring to light this rich and, and significant value of studying history and seeing history live uh, and, and enacted through uh, what we do at AMMC. So I, I'm looking forward to uh, that job. I'm looking forward to um, really um, building on the majority rule principles uh, and recognizing uh, the fight uh, that happened in the past and seeing how we can make that work in the present. Mm -hmm. And then paying homage to the people who worked in that field, who did those things, uh, and seeing how we could recognize and commemorate them now. Yeah. So when we look at that, when we talk about the, the heritage buildings, because we have a lot of buildings that we should preserve that, that people are letting just fall, up, fall away kind of thing, maybe because they don't have the finances to maintain it. Yeah. There might be some way of doing that. You have the statues, the forts, some hills, and a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. How does these things impact us or influence us in our identity and to be able to empower us to do things to cause us all to become of a better uh, country? Well, you, you know, statues for one and memorials are like mnemonic reminders. That's a big word. That just means that when you see a statue, it brings mm -hmm. to light in your memory, in your head an idea or concept, uh, a right. familiar scene or, or something. It triggers a thought. Mm -hmm. uh, the unfortunate thing is the statues that we have littered around our city in Nassau mm -hmm. tend to remind us of colonialism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lo location mm -hmm. is everything. I mean, we could talk about Columbus statue in front of Government House or Queen Victoria in Parliamentary Square. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm a big fan of having positive statues to remind us of those key monumental periods in our country's history. If we first, for one, had a much bigger statue of Milo Butler instead of a bust facing yeah. Queen Victoria, if we, for one, had a pendling statue that wasn't hidden on the side of the airport but was in a right. more pronounced place, if we, for one, had a statue uh, of Ronnie Butler in a, in a place that could recognize musicians as, as great uh, Bahamians and, and a statue of Sydney as well, I mean, this would just do a lot for the psyche of our people, right? Mm -hmm. So. The mnemonic value of a statue is so important. Okay? And it gives it gives um, privilege to place and space. Okay. For one mm -hmm. reason or another, we have privileged the wrong people in the mm -hmm. wrong place, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we have to figure out a way to reverse that cycle. Yeah, well, you know, I recommended um, some time ago and to each administration thereafter uh, for about three or four now, mm -hmm. we need to put some Milo rail Christopher Columbus is. Um, I know you have a different person you want to put there, but I think um, that's who we most recognize right now as. Well, I, 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 well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't push, I wouldn't push my own agenda. I, I have, I, I, my, my thing is just put somebody that represents the people more than Columbus. No, no, fair uh, enough. Can, yeah, yeah, we could, we could. There's a whole list of people that could go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking based on what what has happened. Um, in yeah, the past. but Agreed. one Agreed. one thing to me, which is big to do, on um, if if you all give me the air, what it is, is that I think a statue of um, Black Tuesday should go where Queen Victoria is. That's a beautiful a idea. Big yeah. With the people reaching up, um, catching the mace coming down. Yeah, you know, that's a really cool idea. And, and another thing that you could do, this is uh, maybe going way out the box here, but, you know, we are so into um, um, live, uh, what am I trying to say? I'm not a visual artist, you have to forgive mm -hmm. me here. Uh, we, tend, we tend not to, to go towards abstract art, you right, know, the symbolism right. and impressionism. We tend to go with, with the actual, uh, you know, structures of the, of the body and the face. Uh, and, 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 you know, so, so sometimes an image or, or, or a, 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 um, an artist's rendition of an idea is just as powerful mm -hmm. as a, a still life uh, full-featured um, picture of a person. 
Right. So that that's something to consider um, because we need to do that. Yeah. So my mom here is saying that um, has the government high school. Sorry, let me start over. Has the government high school, uh, <laughs> Nassau Court, being established as a historic site? Well, one of the things I'll tell you what we're doing. Uh, we also have been creating a inventory list. Uh, it's a very active project. Matter of fact, I have a meeting tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, about this very matter, um, extending our inventory list and adding new buildings, new structures to that list. It's something that we're working on right now. Mm -hmm. So definitely, we would consider the the old government high school. I gotta have. I gotta say it right. The government high school. Mm -hmm. Some people prefer the government the, high school. Yeah, they say the. Yeah, the government, the government high school. I say so all, all of that. <laughs> I say da, 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 da. Bahamian, that's Bahamian language. That's a yeah, language. yeah. All, all of that is being, mm -hmm. is going to be considered. Um, mm -hmm. There's some other buildings that I would love to feature. And again, beyond the inventory, uh, you also then have to have a signage campaign, you know, mm -hmm. which we're, we're, we're all interested in doing as well. To have the entire area mapped out with proper signage, everything standardized, uh, we're going to be working hopefully with the Ministry of Tourism to get that done as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, that is a, a one of those things that is another immediate attention that we need to address. So um, I'm glad that your your mom mentioned this. Uh, she chimed in. Uh, I'm fa fantastically um, thrilled to see people make these comments. It makes my work even more exciting. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. Great. Well, we're wrapping up now, Doc, um, because, you know, we could go on another hour um, because I've probably got three more pages that I probably won't even touch on. Uh, we'll have to bring you back for those. But um, the role of these voices, we talked about and, and, and you touched on that. But besides Election Day, what vehicles does the people have um, through these things to, to, yeah. to cause change or do that, that's a very good problem. question because you know unfortunately we feel like you know the people only get to 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 be a part of the democratic process once every five years so you know for the other four uh plus years it's like you know the politicians do their thing if we had true local government where we had you know elected okay. officials if we had a mayoral system it would probably sound like lester cox right now <laughs> but if we had if we had city government mm -hmm. and we had other tiers of government where people were voting more often on issues and, and stuff like that then we would mm -hmm. have a an electoral um system mm -hmm. an electorate really that were more engaged but it's true a lot of people feel like you know, I only get to, to exercise my rights once every five years. And that's unfortunate. Uh, we need more civic mindedness in our country. Mm -hmm. We need marching. We need people protesting. Uh, but we also need to have uh, opportunities for people to have their voice heard. Right. And, and I know um, the former speaker was trying to do some things too. And so, Doc. We really like to thank you for being on, but before we go, we know we always ask I ask you if there's something that you would like to express to the to the public yourself. Um, you well, know, I, I just want to uh, express my gratitude for uh, people reposing in me, I guess, confidence um, in my new position. Mm -hmm. I know I wasn't I wasn't voted in, but um, <laughs> I I feel that I have the mandate of the people behind me because I know for a lot of people that you know they really take seriously heritage and, and history and uh, you know I, I feel that um, I'm, I feel like I'm like a defender <laughs> of the faith I'm a defender of, of what is Bahamian and I have to um, take that role very seriously uh, and in all things uh, do everything and above board and um, to the best of my ability and so that's what I'm saying and I'm thankful for being allowed to come on your show and to be able to talk about majority rule to Sydney and to talk about these matters related to AMMC. Thank you for the time. Awesome, awesome. And um, you're welcome. And I would like to say that I think people follow you and respect you because your you aura that comes towards people are being authentic and unbiased. I mean, you have your biases, obviously, but <laughs> in the conversation, you always listen you always seem to have that listening ear which a lot of times when we talk to people people are just talking to say what they want to say but they're not really hearing what the other person is saying 
And I think that's a good thing. Uh, um, continue to do that, and that would do really well for you. In your I appreciate life. it, and I, I, I hope that I can continue to do those things uh, and to God be the glory. Thank you so much, Leanne. You're welcome. You're welcome. And thank you to all of you out there in um, social media um, around the world and here in the Bahamas. Um, we appreciate you much. Um, we hope you enjoyed your majority rule holiday. We won't have another holiday for a little while until Easter. And then after that, I think it's, it's, it's down to Labor Day or something like that. Um, and so forward. Now, Madam Producer, um, you're always special. Um, I don't know how you do it, but you know, you all 21 miles away from me, but we still get it done. And, um, and so forth. And so as we always say, we like you to pause, think about it with intentional thought and consider where we go from here. You're welcome to join the team in any which way you wish to support the cause of trying to educate the youth in particular, but the nation as a whole, and to talk about things that are not sung all of the time. So if you know a people and the like who has information that you feel that can be a benefit to our community of the 242, be sure to shoot us a note and tell us about it and we want to be able to deliver guests like Dr. Curry who you would want to hear from and not just hear me talk on the radio or, or, or the like. And so thank you all again kindly, um, Doc. Mm -hmm. um, blessings to you. Stay safe, mm -hmm. isolate, or vaccinate. <laughs> Madam producer?